These days, it seems like we want to have fun all the time. Everyone has a plan for making work fun, making learning fun, making laundry fun. And it's become so common and so cloying. It's almost enough to make you want to swear off fun forever. Games are perhaps the only medium daft enough to measure their aesthetic value with a nebulous concept like this, like fun. And as a result, games tend to be seen as a form of, of black magic. We, we know that they have a power over people, and we can't quite characterize that power, which makes us desperate to control it. You know, educators wonder, what are all my students doing in Minecraft all day? And parents wonder, why can my kid lead a World of Warcraft guild but can't finish his homework? And all of us wonder, why, why are we so addicted to Candy Crush? And we tend to think that games are powerful because they, they deliver this payload of fun. We think we want to have fun everywhere. But what does it mean to make something fun? Do we even know what it means? If you wanted to design a fun toaster or a fun tasting menu or a fun conference talk, how would you go about it? We've misunderstood fun to mean something like enjoyment without effort. And that's why every activity now has someone trying to gamify it, as the, as the consultants keep saying, to make it fun, to turn it into a delightful morsel of sugar in your mouth. And in fact, it's with that morsel of sugar that many of us first learned about how games supposedly make things fun, thanks to that great philosopher of fun, Mary Poppins. So if you remember how the, the, the mystical Victorian nanny assures the bank's children, she says, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And this song rehearses our understanding of fun as enjoyment as opposed to misery. Essentially, what Mary Poppins is suggesting is covering over drudgery, just as the Robin's song supposedly hides the boredom of nest building or something, and the Poppins song hides the boredom of cleanup. But actually, a spoonful of sugar tells us so little about fun that it's, it's kind of embarrassing we've let the song get away with it for so long. In every job that must be done, there is an element of fun. You find the fun and snap, the job's a game. So that sounds great, right? But just try to follow this advice, I dare you. <laughs> if an element of fun is hidden in every job, then how do you find it? Where do you look? By what process does the job become a game? Do I just snap, is that it? Do I need to hire my own supernatural nanny? A spoonful of sugar turns out to tell us what we already know. It's just a tautology. A job seems more fun if it seems more fun. Mary Poppins was selling snake oil, it turns out. <laughs> games and fun are connected not because games are intrinsically enjoyable, but games are fun because they are experiences we encounter through play. And play is the act of manipulating something that doesn't dictate all of its capacities, but that does limit many of them. So Minecraft asks you to survive in a world made of these inhospitable cubes that you can use as resources. And Candy Crush asks you to solve puzzles given a limited supply of powers. And play, it turns out, isn't limited to games at all. It's, it's everywhere. It's in anything we can operate. A mechanism like a steering wheel has some play built in, room through which the steering shaft moves to turn the pinion. Play isn't an act of diversion, but a name for making something work, for interacting with its materials. And that's why we also say that we play an instrument or a sport. There's an old aphorism about golf that calls it a good walk spoiled. And it's meant as a joke, of course, but it underscores something fundamental. Games make no sense, and yet, we take them seriously precisely because they make no sense. The philosopher Bernard Sweets calls it the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. <laughs> There's something unreasonable, something, something foolish about playing games. And, and as it happens, this is where the word fun actually finds its origins, in foolishness. The, the Middle English word that would become fun means a fool or to make a fool of. Like you might say, don't poke fun at me. And the medieval fool, the jester or the trickster, uh, was not reckless. This was an honest-to-God job. Being a fool was a commitment. The fool was expected to see life differently. In fact, Queen Elizabeth is even said to have rejoined her fools for not being critical enough of her reign. What the fool does is ask, what else is possible? And then carries out even the most outlandish answer. That takes a kind of shrewdness. It's not a witless practice. It requires this painstaking attention to detail 
to find something new in a familiar situation, not this anything goes carelessness that we usually think of when we think of fun. In fact, the fool teaches us that fun requires a greater commitment to everyday life, not, not a lesser one at all. And fun isn't a feeling, it turns out. It doesn't involve making something easy or by rewarding it with points as if life is some latent version of space invaders. Instead, fun means deliberately manipulating a familiar situation in a new way. And we can only have fun once we've accepted the truth of that situation, treated it for what it is. Golf isn't a good walk spoiled. It's a way to transform landscapes into a centuries-long hobby. And like golf, the things that we tend to find the most fun are not easy and sweet, like the Banks' cleanup routine. I mean, manual transmissions and knitting are fun because they make driving and fashion hard rather than easy. They expose the materials of vehicles and fabrics, and they do not apologize for doing so. There's a kind of terror in real fun, this terror of facing the world as it really is, rather than covering it up with sugar. And this is where, where Mary Poppins leads us astray. A spoonful of sugar, it hides something. It, it turns it into a lie. It assumes that the subject of our attention can never be sufficient on its own. But when you think about it, a job is made fun not by turning it into a game, but by deeply and deliberately pursuing it as a job. Jobs are fun when their work is meaningful, when their activities matter, when the act of conducting them can be done over and over again with increased adeptness. So fun can't be added to something, no, no more than chocolate turns broccoli into dessert, but you can design and use things with enough resistance to allow this capacity for play. And every now and then, they reward you for doing so. In 2010 at Wimbledon, for example, John Isner and Nicholas Mahout played a match of tennis for three days. Neither one was able to break the other's service to tip the match out of equilibrium, and both of the players served over 100 aces. Isner finally bested Mahout with a 70-68 final set. It was completely ridiculous. They had found something in tennis, the two of them, that nobody had found before, as if they were unearthing a fossil. Two well-matched players could make tennis go on almost forever. <laughs> they coaxed the sport to give up this secret because they treated it with such absurd respect that the game couldn't help but release it. And this is what fun looks like at its best. But you don't need to be a tennis pro to access it. Anyone can play anything with the deliberateness that produces fun. For example, I mean, each morning, you grind your espresso beans and you unclump and tamp them to the right weight and density, which you've discovered over many other mornings. And then you time temperature regulated hot water through the group head to produce this 27 second pull that you've timed. And it balances sourness against bitterness in the particular roast you've chosen. But then next week, you choose a new grind or a new tamp to, to work with a new blend. On Tuesdays, you go out with your friends. And even with the same company at the same bar with the same hot wings, the same complaints about the same co-workers, each evening results in some new discovery. The way a sense of humor responds to a particular story, the way a face blankets a new worry with a familiar gentleness. On Sunday, you mow the lawn, and you use a manual reel mower to reduce noise, to connect yourself physically to the act of mowing, but the blades catch short on your uneven plot, and so over many Sundays, you discover a pace that allows you to keep their momentum through the switchbacks, and while struggling to maintain that control, you refine the straightness of your lawn stripes over the months, over the seasons. Fun comes from the attention and care you bring to something that offers enough freedom of movement, enough play, that such attention matters. And even seemingly stupid, boring activities can be fun in the process. Maybe especially stupid, boring activities can be. Feeling that you are having fun at something is a sign that you've given it respect. And we fail to have fun, we fail to design for it too, because we don't take things seriously enough, not because we take them too seriously. Minecraft is fun because it's not trying to be anything but Minecraft. It's not trying to be Minecraft for physics education or Minecraft for laundry. But imagine if physics and laundry took their practices as seriously as Minecraft takes Minecrafting. Imagine if all the people trying to add fun to their products and services redoubled their commitment to the experience of using them instead. And that's how you design fun, by treating the thing you are making or doing as exactly what it is. Fun isn't a kind of pleasure, or at least it's not a direct kind of pleasure. 
Fun is giving respect to something that doesn't deserve it, becoming infatuated with something for which infatuation seems impossible. Just by working it carefully and deliberately over time in the hopes that it might someday blush before you and reveal its secrets. Thank you.